Okay, so um, once you have all of your um, pollen data um, in the uh, spreadsheet in Tilia and all of the taxon names validated as we did in the last video, that's when you're going to switch over from the data tab to the metadata tab. Um, and so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to sort of walk you through this um, tab by tab um, and show you like what information is, is really important and, and required um, in order to do the data upload. And then, you know, some other places where you might want to enter information if you have it, but it might not uh, apply to all data sets. So I usually start with um, publications. And so in the publications tab, you're going to want to associate um, publications with the data set, all publications that um, relate to any um, any parts of the data that might be in this Telia spreadsheet. And so obviously that would be the publication where um, the pollen data were, were first presented. So that's this top publication here, Ivory and Russell 2016 for this example data set. Um, but also additionally, any uh, publication where something like charcoal data that you associated with pollen or an age model was also developed. And so you know, you'll notice that I've also um, associated a second publication with this data set, this Tierney et al. paper from 2008. So both of these uh, publications are already in here. They exist within Neotoma. But if you're doing a new data set, you're uploading a new data set, chances are you may have to um, enter publication information for the first time um, into Neotoma. So if you're if you're at that stage or you're not sure if a publication is in Neotoma or not, what you should do is you should click this new button. Um, and that takes you to this new publication pop-up window. If you want to search to see if a publication is already within Neotoma, um, hit the Neotoma right there, and then you can do a search. So I'm going to search my own name with um, a percent sign in order to do a wildcard search. And so these are all of the publications um, with my name associated with it that are already have been signed an ID and they're within Neotoma. Um, and so the, if I was, if I was, when I was loading this data set, um, what I would want to look for is, so this is the publication where the pollen was presented. I would want to, if that publication is listed there, I would want to click it and click use, and then it will populate uh, that citation information um, into the publications tab. Um, if, if I, if in contrary, if, if, if you do not, if you're, if you're entering a new data set from a new site for the first time, and I do not find the publication that I am looking for, then you're going to have to enter that information manually. So I would then press cancel to go back to this new publication window. And then I would fill out um, all of this information or as much uh, information as is relevant. And I'll kind of show you what that looks like in a second. So what that would look like um, once you've entered that information, it would be like this prior citation information that I've already done. So I would enter the author's information, one author per line, and I usually do uh, last name, comma, first initial uh, period for each of the authors, the year of publication, the title, uh, the journal, the volume, and then so for this journal there are not there are no issues, so there was no issue, but if the issue is relevant, put that as well, uh, page range, and then the DOI in a format like this. So, and make sure that you get that DOI. Most publications these days have them. Um, and that is, is an important also to associate with the citation. So that's the information that you should enter. Um, and once you do that for a new publication, you can upload that publication to Neotoma and it will assign it this Neotoma publication ID. So when you do that also, what it's gonna have you do is you're gonna have to go through an extra step where you also associate um, author uh, contact information with, with each of the authors and co-authors. And I can show you what that would look like um, by clicking this update box. And so if you're uploading a new publication, it will take you through a very similar workflow where it will show you um, the family name and the initials for each of the authors that you listed on the publication, and then guess if there is already a Neotoma contact um, in the database that exists that you can associate that author with. And so for this one, obviously, this is me. I, I already have an existing um, Neotoma contact with an ID number in the database. Um, and so, you know, I can associate this author name with that uh, contact information by saying match. And then the same is also true 
of Jim Russell, who, you know, it has appropriately matched with his contact information. Now, in the case of there being um, an author that does not have contact information yet in the database, um, you will want to fill out all of this information uh, for those new contacts. Um, and in particular, the information that you're going to want to put in there are like contact information, like email addresses and, and affiliations are usually really useful. Okay, so once you have all that information in there, you've entered the contact information for each of the authors, and you have assigned a publication idea ID to new publications, you can press OK, and then um, each of the, the publications associated with this data set will be populated um, in this window. So after publications, um, I usually then go back to the beginning and start with the site information. So the site information will usually be, so if it's a sediment core, it's going to be a lake name. It wouldn't have to be a lake name, um, but it is, of course, um, in the example of this data set. Um, and then the next thing I do is associate a latitude and a longitude with the site. So the, with the site, not the core location. And this is usually a bounding box around the lake. Um, so the best way to do this is to go to this little Google Maps thing and click that. Um, the first thing that I usually do, you know, if you haven't done this already, it's going to pop it up to some random location. You can type the name of your site into this search box and, and oftentimes it will be able to find your lake. Um, and then I click, make sure this box option radio button is clicked, um, and that allows you to construct this bounding box around the lake. And so you can change that by clicking on um, these cardinal direction buttons and then moving around the limits of that bounding box until they, you know, sort of uh, fit the lake relatively well. So that's how you get um, the coordinates filled in there. Um, you also should enter information about the country and the region, and then as far down into these geopolitical divisions as you can. Um, more importantly are altitudes of the site, um, site areas, and then any parameters of a lake, if you're talking about a lake that, that you um, can reasonably add, and then some sort of a site description is usually good. Um, in collection unit now, we're not talking about the site, we're talking about the core itself, if it's a core, or if it's middens, it's, it's that set of, of middens. Um, so the first option on here is handle. So this is what that core, for example, will be called. So oftentimes uh, a collection unit has an official name that's relatively long, that has a lot of information coded in it. And so from this core from Lake Tanganyika, uh, this is the actual official core name, um, but it's oftentimes abbreviated as KH3, and so I've made the, can the handle for this core KH3. I chose core as the collection unit, and then also entered this official name, entered information about the collection device, the actual core that was used, um, the collectors, which was uh, Jim Russell, information about the site, the date it was collected, uh, the type of lake, this is a rift lake, so tectonic origin lake. Uh, these are fine-grained sediments, so clay or mud. And then um, the water depth um, in which that core was collected. And then finally, very importantly, the GPS coordinates of the actual site of the core collection in decimal degrees. Okay, so that's collection unit. Um, and then the data set is going to be information about the investigators and the publications associated with each of the data sets that you have in your data tab. Um, and so I actually have two data sets in my data, data tab. I have a pollen data set and a microcharcoal data set. Um, and so I'm gonna wanna make sure that I choose investigators, publications, and data processors for each of those data sets. Um, now you'll notice there's a bunch of other tabs here as well. So geochronology is where you include um, information about all of the dates, the absolute dates that were taken um, on your record. And so for this, for me, this is all radiocarbon dates, but it may be a combination of radiocarbon lead 210 and, and OSL dates, um, or you know, other, lots of other geochronometers as well, but only absolute dates. No stratigraphic correlations are included within these tables. And I have a separate video to show you how to enter these. Um, and then a, a chronology tab that um, allows you to enter information about the construction of the age model, um, in particular uh, for the publication 
uh, for the published age model that the data was first presented in. Um, and then there's three other tabs that allow you to enter other sort of core based metadata um, that uh, if you have that information, it's great to associate it with it. Um, but if you don't, um, you also can leave those blank. So information about the lithology of the core, if that's available. Um, loss on ignition data, which is commonly uh, available even with older publications. If that data is available, it's great to um, put that uh, in here as well. And then um, stable isotopic data, which can also be uploaded to Neotoma. Okay. Um, so that is the metadata tab. As I said, I will have a, two separate videos for showing you how to um, enter the geochronological information um, and the chronologies.